Welcome. This is a July 9th Jail and Zones production user call. We have Dave, Nick, Jan, and myself, Michael. A few folks are on vacation. I respect that. And uh, this I learned. You can't list the directory in Lua, but you can shell out or write some C. So Dave, you have a CI update that brought that bit of enlightenment. Do you want to do a demo? Yeah, so there's a few interesting things I've sort of been learning along the way here. So the first one, as Michael mentioned, is that um, Lua is a really lightweight language. You can read a file in Lua, but you, there are no functions to read directories. So um, this is Lua 5.4 specifically, but I think it applies to all the Luas. Um, and so you either shell out to LS um, or you call some C stuff. So the reason why I wanted Lua um, in this system was, was mainly just for fun, I guess, to be honest. But... Lua is really well designed for sandboxing and it's got a very, very straightforward C integration, um, which is evidenced by the fact that I can use it at all. And um, it's also used elsewhere in, in FreeBSD. You, you can't use EPFI um, without adding extra stuff. So the goal was um, not, not to use those things there. So um, the idea here is we start off with um, one process which forks one of the forks does stuff in the jail and the other fork does the stuff talking to the network um, shoveling bits around and generally doing normal sort of unprivileged io and what we want is to start up grab a bunch of configuration parameters shove them into some sort of structy thing share that with both the lower sandbox and with the other um, non-privileged network fork and um, allow the user to supply untrusted scripts that we can run inside the Lua sandbox. So um, what are two good examples of this? So one of them is we want the user to be able to do things like mount directories, uh, sorry, mount file systems, um, load things, secrets like SSH keys and other things like that. Um, but we don't want them to be able to escape the jail. So how do we do that? We've got to um, read the Lua script, inject it into our Lua state, and then when we fork, um, the access to the original file system is now gone. So when we fork in jail, uh, access to the original file system is gone, and but we still have our Lua scripts that the user provided. So any secrets they want us to read from the, um, the the root file system is now available in the jail, but the jail can't get access to anything else. And the general design of this looks like it's um, it's going to work. I'm still struggling with some little bits, little accesses, um, sorry, little aspects of sandboxing. So I thought we'd have some nice color to start off with so you can see some progress. Um, uh, let's make that a bit bigger and do a screen sharey thing, yeah? Where did I find that? Here it was. Uh, there we go. Yep, so let's just make this a bit bigger. Oops, wrong window. So in the bottom, we've got a fake server. There is actually a real um, web server that goes with this, but it's less exciting as command line people because... Um, we don't get to see what's actually happening. So um, pretty standard sort of dev thing here. I clear the screen, clean the thing, and, and then make it, and then exec just run it, runs it. And um, if we do that, let's go up to the top. Bit of compilation stuff we don't care about. Um, and here it's the command it's running. It connects to a WebSocket thing. Um, and eventually somewhere down here it talks to you always to get a bunch of parameters that was kind of fun and here's the interesting lure bit here so this all this logging here is happening in um via a, a lightweight c library that just prints out colored strings because i love color and the line number where it's logged at and then here we start doing c stuff and plugins we load our lua sort of vm and initialize it and then we tell the lua vm hey um, this log module that's written in C, you want to be able to use it from inside Lua as well. So we get nice colored logs. And that's Did you make that bigger? Sorry to interrupt. Doing. 
uh, the other screens are pretty good. Cool. This one's tiny. Effect by C um, modules. Mark, you got a question? Yeah, Resident. could you make that bigger? So sorry. Oh, I've lost. We've lost audio, haven't we? Oh, uh, I hear you. Have we lost audio. I can hear you. We can hear you. Let me make a note there. <laughs> In chat, uh, we can hear you. Uh, please make that clear. Okay, I'm back with audio. Oh, font size plus plus. Oh, we have video, audio, but no screen. So try the share and just punch up oh, yeah, the size yeah. if you could. Yeah, so sorry. sorry. Thank you. It's all right. It's my bad at this end. Uh, was a computer involved? I always ask clients. The computer was involved. So where do yeah. we get to? We're just getting the interesting stuff. Yeah, but just I punch that bigger buttons. if you could, please. Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, we can sort of see for the log stuff here. We're tracking along on C plugins, 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 and then we switch over. And here we load um, three three sort of modules. One of them is a um, a log module which is written in C. It's a nice coloured logs, and we want to make that available in Lua. And then we switch over to the other side of it, and we actually want to load Lua plugins, um, and then call them from the C side when that's convenient. And um, after that here, we're doing Lua things here. It says like Lua init, um, Lua state started, and then listing the plugins that are available um, and um, printing out a data structure here. This is just me passing data structures across. And then after that, um, it complains bitterly because the other end isn't connected. So let's run one where we actually do the full, the full um, cycle here. Go down the bottom, clear the screen there, and make that a bit bigger. Thank you. Um, we can do this probably, it's even better. Okay. This will become evident. I need to, I need, uh, I need to borrow this text in a second. So let's go back here, put our web server going, do the compilation thing. And what we can see amongst all this garbage here is that the client has sent this register thing and it's saying, hello, I authenticated already. But now here's my capabilities. I'm an AMD64 box called Winter Mute. Um, I run FreeBSD in current, and I have some magical UUID. And so what the server then replies is it says, I accept your registration, and then it'll send you a job to do, which in our case is ignored, because I'm still running the just ping on this branch. So let's send the text. And there's our job here. It's got a, you know, it's got a pretty standard UUID. Um, I, didn't put, I didn't put accept, did I? So let's start that again. I did it wrong. Too easy. So now I go accepted. Okay, the client says, yeah, you've got accepted. I'm good to go. Um, but we notice we've already got a child fault here. So the child is waiting in the jail um, with the Lua scripts that we've handed to it, ready to go and do stuff. And then we send it our job. No, we don't. We try again. We send it a job. Okay, I might have to copy paste again. I've done this a lot every day. There we go. And this all happens a bit fast. I'm not sure why, but the pings don't actually wait a second. It doesn't really matter because I'm not really interested in the time delay. And um, what we get is the output back here because it's C stuff, it's getting buffered. So we actually get all three lines all at once um, and some jumbled log messages, which isn't so important at this stage. Um, stuff happening inside and outside the jail um, and... Um, finally the unfinished code here, which is actually uploading the file and hashing it, which is not so dramatic. I'm going to add that probably last, and then it ends, and it's ready to do another one. Um, so that's kind of what happens, and then the plugins shut down and clean themselves up, and everything is gone. So it's just worth a quick look at the Lua little bits in here. So I'm going to go plugins. We want probably all of these. Here we go. So let's start off with the easy stuff. Um, the Lua init script is pretty simple. It just uses the C module that we've exposed and says, hey, call the C function to log this out. So from the Lua side, I've got this really nice um, module that I can use, and it's managed from the C side um, before we enter the jail. So all that stuff is set up. If I want it to send it to syslog or somewhere else, I can do that, and I don't need to change the Lua interface. Um, this zen.state is just getting a variable um, that's actually a pointer on the C side of things. So every time you call this, it goes out and queries the the um, the C side of our program to find out what the current state is. 
And this is actually the bit we use to decide in every Lua module, do you need to run or not? So a module has to declare itself to say, I want to run in all the states, so call me every time there's a hook, or I'm really only interested in the mount or the cleanup phase of the jail, so only call me then. And so we use this, this state here for plugins to find out whether they need to, uh, need to run or not. Um, and this one here is doing the same thing, except instead of a single variable calling a function, we're actually iterating over um, a table, um, uh, which you can think of as an array, um, which is passed to us from the other side. And then down here, um, a bunch of environment variables, um, which are passed through. So when we create our jail, we don't hand over all the environment variables. And so what we're doing here is putting inside Lua the environment variables we want the um, user scripts to have access to. So the Lua side is pretty standard, and this Lua plugin couldn't get any more simpler. It just exists. That's all it does. Um, and on the C side, I didn't want to go too much into this because I'd probably make mistakes or get it wrong. But as you can see here, we load a lot of Lua gobbledygook. Um, and if we look at log at H, um, way down the bottom here is, uh, where does it start here? The Lua stuff. Um, oh yeah, here it is. Um, there really wasn't a lot to add the functionality to get the logging stuff to be available in Lua. And um, I just sort of call this up and um, from the Lua side, when um, this shared library is opened, um, the Lua side looks for this Lua open function and then loads it. Um, so it was pretty easy. Um, it, I was really surprised how well that worked. It wasn't easy to figure out this, that I spent several hours bashing my head against that. But once I got that working, it was fine. Um, so on the plugin side, the easiest one here is, in, in Lua we have this little state. Um, and if we start from the bottom up, that makes more sense. Uh, where are we here? Go down here. Um, when we initialize our, our, our Lua state, um, we declare a, a new Lua state. So that's like an empty variable from that point of view. And that should probably work. I'm not expecting any of this to fail. And then we import Lua, import Lua standard library. You don't actually have to do this. And that's what's cool about Lua sandboxing is if you don't import the standard library, then there are no functions at all in Lua other than what you give to it. Um, and that's what makes this really nice and easy for sandboxing. So my next step after making the rest of the plugins work is going to be adding a, a ZFS snapshot capability. Yeah, not even math functions, nothing. Um, I, I don't know how bare boned it is, but if it's A plus B, it'll work. And if it's math.a or math. I don't know, sine or cos or whatever, it won't. Um, um, so the ZFS library is going to be a bunch of, doesn't really matter whether it's going to be um, sort of shell out to run ZFS or something fancier or some other C library that does the heavy lifting. Um, it'll all be wrapped up and it'll only be available through a ZFS namespace. And that means I can tell the clients, hey, you get to do snapshots, roll snapshots back. Um, but on the Lua side, I can do the sensible things like checking that the path is correct. Um, and requiring that I've got delegated um, privileges to do that. Um, here's me loading the log module that we just looked at. And it's pretty simple. It just looks for log.o and says there should be a function called lua open.log in there. Um, and once that's loaded, we pop it off the stack and um, tell everyone we loaded it. Um, same thing here for this module. I didn't call it plugins. This is the name it's exposed under um, in, in the from the Lua side. So this one is log colon trace or whatever. And this one is Zen colon stuff. And um, yeah, where do we need to go to here? We need to go back up the top. So this is setting up Lua. Now we've initialized Lua. We can sort of go back and look at the functions that do it. So um, Here we register in Lua again. It's just saying, hey, call Lua. There's going to be a variable called state. Um, and it's going to call this 
when you access this 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 variable, this, I suppose this function really is not a variable. When you call this function from Lua, we're going to call this C function. And um, here again is the enormous bit of code I wrote to make that work. And it's the same th sort of thing again. Call some C function somewhere else, which is from the states module here. And that one does the uh, the bit of looking up inside the config data and getting the right string out. And then just push this onto the stack. So our interaction with Lua is... Um, stack based and we keep passing around the state and say to Lua, I put a couple more things on the stack. It's up to you, the C developer, to know what's on your stack and to manipulate it in the right order. So in that respect, it feels a lot like doing fourth again. Um, oh, the irony and free best of replacing a stack based bootloader with a stack based um, bootloader, but with nice interfaces. Yeah. Um, and, and I find this bit actually that the hardest bit with Lua is going, okay, I'm in this function. This is what's on my stack. Um, my plan is to get very quickly to not have any anything more to do in this space and have almost everything else written as plugins. So the goal here is that um, the first plugin is just going to say hello world, um, but for doing things like ZFS mounts, for setting firewall rules if they're needed, um, anything like that that needs to be done inside the jail and talking to the outside um, is going to be done from the Lua side um, and ideally over time once I've figured out more about Lua and more about C we'll keep reducing the amount of C till it's almost zero um, and it'll all be in Lua um, yeah but that's kind of where it's got to um, and this is kind of a, I think this has been um, a lot of fun and as I said you know here I've got to read directories from the file system in C and then I hand that over to the Lua side but um, from a sandboxing approach, that's actually great because it means the only way to load a file in here is if my loader allows you to do that. So from a sandboxing perspective, again, here, it's it's really, really safe. And um, when we fork the processes, the Lua is already set up in the fork. It has all the data it needs, and then it jails itself and now we're inside the jail running Lua with the original information, but no access to the file system again. I think that's pretty neat. Um, I didn't expect it to fall out quite as easily as that. There's no capsicum yet, um, but the capsicum stuff will go in, in here. Um, and it shouldn't be very complicated. It's just going to be changing. I think in this whole file here, there's just two things that actually read from file systems. Um, one of them is opening the directory itself. There we go, open dir um, and read dir, and then um, the other one reading the string off, and that's and that's it. Um, so at this point here, we're unsandboxed in Lua. We're uncapsicumized, but capsicumizing it should be easy. Um, and then we read the files, and then when we switch over inside the jail, that's only when the stuff get ex gets executed. At least that's my understanding of it anyway. But that's, uh, that's where we're at at the moment. Uh, questions welcomed. Um, uh, if I go down the bottom, you can see this sort of very much this. Um, yeah, yeah, here we go. Here, Here's the sort of stack based stuff here. Put a thing. Th this, this little construction of lines 100 to 103 is take the plugins um, table that we just generated, which is a list of the plugins on disk. Um, and put it inside the existing Zen table so that it can be used inside the inside the uh, um, inside the jail. And then um, I go further down, and I've got to do the same thing with the um, env table. Um, and then, yeah, lots of, lots of that sort of stuff. Put stuff on stack. Put stuff off stack. Um, repeat, rinse, repeat. Um, yeah, that's that's it so far today. So you're it will be nice to have this lined up. It's coming along. I've got one big problem to solve left, I think, um, and that is um, my original intention was that the forked jail would have no knowledge of the WebSocket process, so no way to to leak data out. But I need to because I fork off early, the jail's here with the Lua stuff in it. That's good. 
but it doesn't know what it needs to do. And the fork on the outside with the network access knows what it needs to do, but it needs to communicate between the two. And I have a Unix socket for this. I just haven't done that sort of stuff before. And this is likely um, to be trickier than I expected. If you only need one direction, you could use um, a sealed memory segment. So memfd uh, create, seal it as read only, and then pass it down. So that you basically puts puts in uh, something as simple as the argument vector for the child process or something. Uh, and maybe. it would be a unidirectional single message, and you can only read it, and there's no back channel to leak anything. Yeah, the, the general idea here is that um, I'm going to run. I, I, I thought a lot about this thing, thinking I should keep the jail around and um, keep using it again and again, but it makes, from a sort of a design perspective, it quite a lot harder, and it doesn't really cost anything to set up the jail from scratch each time. It's just a, you know, a, a couple of milliseconds um, at most. So um, what I'm doing at the moment is I need to inform the jail, hey, here's the command you need to run, go and do it, and... All I know at the end is the jail will exit and I get to see the exit process or not. Um, what so, are um, that sounds so, like a perfect use for a memfd where you basically put the argument vector in and in the after then you inherit that you map it and just point exact v e at it. Hmm. I, I think initially I'm gonna start off with just writing a file inside the jail. Um, in the right place because uh, I don't but, want to spend lots and lots of time making that work and that's the simplest But the way. file is not easier to use in this regard. The file is Maybe. harder to use because you have to worry about file names. Maybe. Um, the user in the jail doesn't only has to have read access to the file which maybe makes it a little simpler. So you call this, what do you call it? Um, M, what do you call MFD it? create or uh, it's a wrapper around shim open. Oh, okay, shared mem open. I've dealt with the stuff in Perl many years ago. MFD is it underscore. Yeah, if you dealt with it in many years ago in Perl, it worked differently and never hurt. Things I changed in the kernel. I, I can't Probably find it. Is it MFD in the man pages? I oh, mem FD. My bad. Okay, there we go. Uh, it doesn't want to find it. Here we go. Let's have a look. So in previous, the uh, 13 and later you can, you don't have to truncate as an M map to write, uh, you can instead just write and it will grow and then you seal it and uh, afterward it can only be destroyed, it can never be modified again. And it gets auto garbage collected by the kernel when the last file descriptor tool is closed. Right, so, so it's a run. really convenient interface for not storing really this kind of configuration in an open file descriptor. And if you want the content to be the pure argument vector, that's basically the shell arguments to a process, that's fine. Uh, you can nmap it uh, and then it works. We, basically, this is, this is roughly what I'm sending here along there. I've got, I've got two things. I send this request in, and then I need to get the contents of one file out. But the getting the file out, I will do that from outside. Uh, no, it has to. The, I have to get the file out. It's, it's a looking inside a Git directory. So the jail has to do the work of cloning the repo and finding the appropriate file in Git. And then I've got to send that back out to the uh, to the parent to go and do stuff with. 
So if you want to stream it out to the parent, use a pipe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've got a pipe already, so maybe I just put stuff in the pipe. Um, or if you don't want to use standard out, you can either use an extra pipe uh, with the uh, semantic that you have to write your complete message to it and then close the pipe. Yeah. Uh, or uh, if you, or you could have a writable FD to send back, if, but then you kind of have to fit it all into memory, which can be a problem. Whereas a pipe enabled screening processing, if that makes sense in Google's case. Yeah, I, I think what's going to happen is over time, I will find more and more reasons to send things between the two processes by a pipe. Um, ideally, I'd like to keep the jail around between requests and just do ZFS rollbacks. That would be really nice. Um, rollbacks are not that inexpensive if you have a big diff. Well, it may be cheaper to... Uh, Create a new clone. Um, so we, we can't. And if so, you want to keep the jail around, just destroy the clone and create a new one because um, then the destruction is asynchronous, whereas the rollback is synchronous. Yeah, uh, it's, even for quite large data sets like FreeBSD source trees, I found it wasn't really a significant delay. Well, all of this is dominated by, at the end, someone needs to shovel um, megabytes of data across the network. So... Um, megabytes of data shouldn't be a bottleneck on the network, yeah, <laughs> inside no, your data center. Your, your internet is better than my internet. <laughs> I noticed the difference, yeah. Hundreds of megabytes of data, yeah. Um, yeah, and the jobs don't take... The jobs are not instant either, so you've got to bear that in mind. Even though my pings take place in you know a few microseconds here, a, a, a normal job is going to take um, many minutes to run. So we're but not really even at ten uh, just ten gig a gigabyte is a second mm. at line rate. But most people don't have between the between the the um, the two platforms they're dealing with. Maybe but some people do, but I'm not designing for the circumstance where people have all got ten gigs lying around. Um, I'm bearing in mind that some people will be like me sitting behind a crappy home ISP with um, um, insufficient data. Um, uh, but sorry, they have ASP. caching in place. Yeah, but the and have a local Git mirror. Yeah, but the job is different every time. So the results are always different. The artifacts are different. Um, anyway, it's coming along nicely. So I've got I um, the, the plugin stuff is coming along, and I think I should have that finished this week. And then um, I've got next week to figure out exactly how to get the messages in and out. Um, and I think that's going to be um, a bit of trial and error. Um, and probably I'll, I'll, spring in, I'll sprinkle in the capsicum stuff on the Lua side as soon as I've got it working. I've done it before in um, Erlang. That was actually quite an interesting experiment, putting capsicum uh, onto the Erlang VM. So the Erlang VM has no security at all, really. Um, and it was pretty neat to have the whole Erlang VM switch itself into capsicumized mode and not crash. Um, so, uh, Dave, if I remember correctly, the FreeBSD libc function FTS and friends works in capability mode if you use it with a directory file descriptor. So that always uses the something something add system called family, if possible, as long as you don't give it absolute paths. So, what do you call uh, it? Uh, uh, oh, file, file, file hierarchy key traversal. So that's uh, maybe a lot nicer to use than having to do the recursion yourself if you need post uh, pre and post order uh, directory transversal and so on. Uh, I did not know um, about this. Yeah. It's not a POSIX, but it's available in glibc and has been for decades, I think. Um, so it's, it's even Solaris supports it. Yeah. It's ancient BSD. Yeah. It's not free BSD, it's pre free BSD. Uh, yeah, 4.4 BSD, it says. It's basically the tree transfer the logic for find. To the point uh, of the lots of each of which describes hmm? one of the priorities. 
I'm just squizzing the main page here. Mm -hmm. So I just prefer this, unless I know exactly the half of uh, the form of the tree I want to look at and know that it has, let's say, only two layers and then exploit the special structure. Yeah. But if you want to have a generic walk this directory recursively, that function family is your friend. You That's going to be convenient. I haven't added this yet, but the final, the very, the very last piece of functionality I'm adding is the bit that walks through. So the, the user will supply a directory inside the jail that says, here are the things I want to keep and upload. And um, I need to walk those directory trees, filter out stuff they don't want, and then um, hash and upload the ones they do. So that's going to be very handy. Or you could wait if you want to hash and upload, take a look at lib archive, uh, because that already supports emitting things like an M tree uh, with cryptographic checksums. And M tree is quite a useful format in FreeBSD because the, 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 the user gives it's not going to be a table or anything, it's going to be just no, no. this to emit a M tree manifest instead of an archive. It's a fake archive. Yeah, I, I, I know I know what it is, but um, what I'm just going to have um, a web directory, which is just the files you uploaded um, by their um, Blake 2 or Blake 3 checksum, um, whichever I can find sitting lying around the FreeBSD. Um, and I'm not quite sure what mtree would give me here other than confusing people who aren't BSD users. You mentioned you're a normal user, not? Um, yeah. Um, for normal users here, um, they would, might be okay with getting a tar download but they would not, would not want to do with any with a, with um, um like an entry archive. So at normal in this case, yeah, not FreeBSD developers, not people who go, I'll just read the man page for that. So uh, assumed you wanted to use it because you had to walk it and so on to just uh, have a recursive checksum over a file tree. If you really want to file tree contents, then the task is perfect. Videos off. Yeah. Sorry, wife is just running away. We've got a small house. Actually, we don't have a small house. So what was that, Jan? I, caught the, I lost the last bit. Um, I, for a moment, assumed you wanted only the recursive checksum of the tree, not the tree content itself. No, I had to, I had to upload both. To compare two trees for basically equal content and not... Yeah. No. So the general idea is... Well, they'll, they'll give me a directory, so I want the things in this with these things and without those things. And um, if there's something in the archive that does that for me, that'd be really handy. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm going to upload all the artifacts found there and store them by checksum and name and uh, probably mime type. Uh, and then the next time around in the next job, you can say, hey, the thing I got the last time, I need that back. Please go and get it for me. Um, and that's the last piece of what I want for this. I'm, but for me personally, I don't want just a thing that builds my software. I want something that's able to deploy it out to the servers that need to do it. So you can imagine a sequence of steps where the first step is um, um, build the software. The second step is um, test the software. And then the third step is on the nodes that need it, roll it out one by one um, automatically without, a, without intervention. Um, and then I'll be a happy camper. And to orient our viewers, that's broadly part of your CI system, correct? You prime a jail and yeah. push out from there. Yeah, build, build the stuff in the jail, peek in from outside to pluck out the key pieces we need and upload them to, uh, to, uh, to somewhere sensible. And then at the end of that, um, fetch it, use that art artifact to unpack and test inside a jail and then repeat. But the next thing that um, 
container might actually be just a server somewhere running um, your normal <clears throat> your normal web application, and we unpack it and do whatever you need to there. Would that ever be a virtual machine? Um, there's no particular reason why what the artifact has to be. It doesn't. It, doesn't it, care. It's not going to care. You'll have a a thing. It might be larger than you want to slap around. It might be too big to do that. Um, unless you have a 10 gig network like Yarn does, and then it's going to be fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't assume that you had 10 gig to be outside, but just on on site in within your rack wherever you host that. Yeah. If you have a faster than one gig internal connection. If you don't, uh, it may be really uh, worth looking into using BS diff and uh, BS patch to give, can use smart diffing between executables to basically say, yeah, that build artifact from a previous commit, use that, and here's a patch against that. And this is the checksum of the result. So. The, the difficulty is you only know afterwards whether that was a good decision. Uh, of course, but the sender knows. Give the sender the choice to, if you have some repository of build artifacts where you collect that stuff and it is yes. over your home internet connection, it's definitely worth on a normal home internet connection to spend the time to check if uh, basically if any build artifact you have. Mm -hmm. Have, which belongs to the same path for a pr commit you are, have another build artifact for, which is an um, ancestor of this commit. Just check yeah. if it's smaller, sufficiently smaller, and then use a, a smart uh, binary diff, which is optimized for common patterns and executable formats and instruction sets to uh, notice if the function is unchanged, but only in a different location and so on. And then you can have BS dev emit a patch, apply the patch, and you barely say to the upstream, apply this patch. Yeah, I mean... If, if you worry about... Then, CPU, then if you don't, patch, if you have exactly. one gig or faster, it's probably not that useful. But if you have a crappy home internet connection, uh, your users will thank you. Yeah, well, it's definitely a crappy home internet connection. How are it's you building your jails? Sorry? How are you building your jails? Um, so right now I'm just using um, Tarifes, so it's super lazy. Um, but um, I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to use um, uh, Podman stuff uh, in the future. Yeah. If I, if I get it right, it'll be all um, agnostic. So at the moment, my test jail is literally you download um, um, base.txz and unpack it, and that's your jail. And obviously, that's fine until you want to have a package installed, and then you have to do it manually. OK, any questions for Dave? Okay, well, thank you for that, and keep us posted, and happy coding. Yeah, it's good, it's good happy coding this week, because the kids are away for a week. Oh, awesome. So, um, there you go. I'm getting a lot done. I'm making hay while the sun shines. I've got kids coming out of my ears. Uh, Dan, do you have any topics? You dropped in as we were plugging through the... No, cool. I, I, well, I thought I did, but I turned out to be wrong about what I thought was wrong. All righty, <laughs> then. That's self-writing, self I suppose. Uh, Jan, did you want to talk about syslog? Yeah, so uh, FreeBSD still uses a traditional way to tr uh, connect and uh, send to syslog, which is uh, connect to a socket in a well-known path uh, and then just send messages. And if that socket is ever invalidated, for example, because uh, syslog D restarts, uh, you have to be able to reopen the path and that means closing a file descriptor, opening a file descriptor, and so on, which are things you can't do or are not supposed to do in a signal handler context, as we've been reminded of uh, last week by the 
um, OpenSSH D uh, exploit, which mostly hits uh, win, uh, Linux based systems, but hey, it is potentially exploitable on FreeBSD. Uh, all of that happened because OpenBSD got used to having uh, syslog underscore um, R, which is a signal safe variant of the function, which gets a context, but they can only do that easily because they have a special system call called send syslog, which um, works from inside a pledge and unveil and then the signal handler context because you don't use the file descriptor argument, basically syslog D registers the one side of a socket pair with the kernel and then everyone gets to uh, use that. On FreeBSD, jails would make that a bit complicated because you probably want jails to be able to run their own syslog and that should then override it so that you're not using the host default socket if you have the per jail one. And if even if you do not want to have your jail uh, run its own syslog D, you probably want the, no, you definitely want the host syslog D to get as much context on each message as possible via ancillary data so that you know the not just the sender's process ID, but also their jail ID and so on in one ancillary data message so that you know the credentials of the sender. Uh, as syslog or can now. So do we hear a proposal um, coming? Yeah, the proposal is to uh, port the census log API extended for jail support to VBFC so that we uh, also have an always available way to talk to syslog D. So because the, the really nasty thing is right now with, uh, with Capsicum, you're shit out of luck if you do not have the directory where the socket is open because then you can't reconnect to syslog D if it gets restarted and suddenly you're Capsicumized demon just is silent and can and our log message are just discarded, or you have to have a pre created um, Casper basically helper process, which is then able to reconnect. But this process can die without taking down your uh, your uh, Capsicumized service, so you have a bit of a problem here and the open PSD uh, system call idea is really uh, the best way we can do and maintain the uh, the syslog API. So it's, uh, go ahead. Yeah. You were asking? Yeah, what in the API removes that ambiguity or you're making it sound so like if it you automatically click has on a the unique... send syslog. Yeah. Uh, so in my, it, and that tags it with something unique for jail or what? No, uh, wait a second. Let's, uh, so if census log, if you go up instead of, it's a system call. Yep. So it's safe to invoke. For, go up for, to the signature, please. Pardon? Oh, this guy? Yep. Okay. Listen up, so, so. Uh, as you can see, it only takes this. A pointer to a string, the length, and a flag set. That's all. It does not take a file descriptor. Uh -huh. Because there's only one syslog D uh, socket in the system in OpenBSD because they don't have jails. What they have is a syslog D, which uh, uses the nioctal on the slash dev log device to register the one to logging socket to the kernel and then anyone using census log can send a message to that socket. And on packet, basically on datagram Unix socket, you can use receive message to receive a bunch of metadata with each packet. But uh, as far as I know, there is no universal way to get all of the metadata I consider relevant to support jail nesting or for the host to act as to know which jail a message came from. 
all in one ancillary data message. So it may be necessary to add a new type there. And then um, there would have to be logic so that you basically from inside a jail, if you register it, believe the instead of making the listening socket, uh, sorry, the receiving socket, um, global it would have to be per struct prison. And if a struct prison doesn't have one, it would have to go up. And if it goes all the way up, um, you have to just see the flags if it's supposed to be written to console if nothing is there. And then you write either to console or you discard. Um, yeah, that's the idea. And in my opinion, it would be good for FreeBSD to, within the FreeBSD 15 timeframe, imp implement this open uh, BSD API so that, yeah, it would be easy to use. And How many have, bits uh, of FreeBSD would that touch? I think just uh, a new system call, an ioctal on dev log, and one new integer size field in struct present. Uh, so let's say uh, one more field for struct prison and, and one, one ioctal handler and one system call. Is, but that's that, something we should discuss when Jamie is back from his cruise. That's a very good observation. So, uh, is a proof of concept he's... within reason, or we simply run the idea by him and see what he thinks? I think uh, for someone not deeply familiar with previous these jail implementation, writing right. a proof of concept would, and then having that review would take more time off yes, sir. the reviewers than uh, having basically taken the idea that's to the someone already familiar. With yeah, that's topic, the magic of the occasional meeting. Go ahead. Reviewing their work if it is what you intended. Yes. Okay. okay. Cool. I do bring that up when the time comes. Yep. We'll do it. Um, Antrenig posted this about those net graph retries. We did a debugging session, seeing like why the heck was that retrying. Uh, he did find a solution to bump up this uh, this sys control value, um, but the review uh, was abandoned insofar as it didn't quite seem like the right approach. And Rod implied, "Hey, that big number is probably out of out of line. It's, I think default of what thirty two or something." Um, that's for those who celebrate or who have been following the calls. Uh, and that's not it. Okay, so anyway, uh, if you are curious, let's do a quick peek, but nothing much. And did it load? There it goes. So, do, do, do. ah, default of 50. I was wrong there. So, uh, to make a long story short, if you're yeah. seeing retries with the but if it's a SysCTL, um, you don't. We can argue about uh, the default value, but users can fix that for themselves already. Uh, true, but I believe it needs to be set at boot time, and it could not be changed dynamically. So, so it's a loader tunable, not a yeah, sys yeah. generic SysCTL. Let's check that. Uh, yep. Loader. There you go. Um, anyway, uh, and it seems every other interface handles that dynamically except for NetGraph. So uh, there you go. Any other topics on this warm, sunny day around the world in most places, or at least where all the attendees are? So yes, that's a good point. And so it, it wouldn't be easy to simply crank up that value while watching it in action, just saying. So. Anything else? 
I have in-laws coming from Europe on Wednesday, so I will be busy preparing this messy office. Well, if uh, you are... If, if you mess up your office badly enough, they will not go in and leave you alone. And you get to keep your office. <laughs> you are not wrong. 1757. <laughs> Cool. Except for the table discussion that will trigger. <laughs> yes. Okay, gang. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dave, for that update. Uh, Godspeed on that. I'm glad you've got some time lined up to work on that. I will be uh, actually working quite a bit on these things also for want of travel or other things. So, yeah, the summer is truly in motion. If that's it, I'm going to call it. Thank you. Have a great one. And I'll stick around a few minutes. That's where you say bye-bye. Bye-bye.